to find a way that we can actually see the chat, right? We had a problem before. Okay. Hmm? Okay. Good. So basically, I think it is too loud. Okay, I'm going to do something like this. Okay, so basically, when we talk about uh, the low resource classroom, then the key question that we have is actually that we need to think about where we are facing this. So before we actually get started with what you can do with it, I'd like you to do one thing and think you're teaching education or your educator, uh, education as a teacher. So the first thing is low resource and no resource classroom, what to expect. So what could be, for example, the student's background to this? I will try to get the chat visible. Um, oh, I think I need to work. Um, no, 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 it's okay. So I just have to press right light. So can you just give me some ideas on that? Ah, okay, well, okay. okay. Good. So, so what, where exactly, what kind of situations would you describe as to expect in a low resource and no resource classroom? Can you use the chat function for this? We are now able to see this. Okay, there's nobody typing. Okay, so, so when we think about students' background in the low resource classroom, then of course we have to think about different situations. So it could be like uh, kids of prisoners or grown-ups in prison. It could be people in refugee camps. That's, uh, of course, what Heart ELT is very much engaged in. It could be remote classrooms somewhere in the middle of nowhere in really rural areas, maybe in Asia, South America, or Africa. A point is, for example, in refugee camps, where do the kids come from? They come very often from a rabbit background. So, and they're often quite young. So you've got no idea if they had previous schooling. You have no idea what their literacy skills are like. You don't even know if they can read the English alphabet or the European alphabet for that. Oh, sorry. Okay, is that better? So can you hear me better? Um, we just try to make the best of the sound here because the sound looks okay on our display. Okay, good. So. Basically, that's the literacy and schooling background. Then maybe, oh, okay, I thank you, that's good. good. So, so the question was actually what to expect regarding students' backgrounds. So just recap briefly. We talk about literacy and schooling. So do they actually have any school experience? And if so, what was it like? Schools don't work the same way all over the world. Are they literacy, literate? What are the literacy skills like? Are they able to read English or European letters, for example, if their first language is Arabic or some Asian languages? What are the learning styles and motivation? We have the experience, for example, in Germany when the refugee kids start school, they're highly motivated because they see education as a prejudice and then they need all these rewards, first years and second years in primary school in Germany, they go like, oops, What's wrong? So suddenly there's this kind of big engine in the classroom. So we think about maybe different learning styles. Yeah. So um, how can you work with textbooks, for example, if, if people work rather with oral tradition learning or if they can't even read? And of course, we have to think of what we call a disruptive classroom. So you have kids who just won't sit still. You have kids who may have been traumatized. And you think you do a nice, easy activity on family vocabulary, but maybe they have a really difficult family situation and some kid will break down into tears or something like that. So you will very often have disruptions in the classroom from the kids but also disruptions may be coming from the outside depending on the circumstances you teach. And all of that, of course, will change the way you need to think about teaching there. So you can't just go back to normal resources like textbooks, internet, audio, video, all these nice tech things. You really have to start from the scratch and do things in a different way. And that's something that we are going to look at. So I hand over to um, Julie okay. again. I think for the next slide because Julie is telling you what we are going to do in the two sessions. We might shorten the break because we started late, but I hope you are okay with that. Okay, I'm back and I hope I've got still got sound, but you never know. You okay. see this? Yeah, I can see how I'm moving there. Um, right, let me just go through what we plan for the two sessions. Um, the first session is basically the whole concept of a magic space and 
teachers create a magic space in whatever scenario they go into. They go in there, they make it cosy, they make it interesting, they motivate the students. And obviously in the no resource classroom you've got even more of a challenge to make kids feel cosy, comfortable. Um, on the one hand, you've got this, the situation, the environment that you're teaching in. If it is a squat, if it's a camp, if there are it's literally a bombed out building. So there's much more of a challenge there for the teachers. But we have actually got our magic wands here. And these are a new thing that I've just been created actually with a bit of bamboo. Uh, but you know, kids love these kind of images. So I think going into the classroom and saying, well, we've got a magic wand. What can we do to make it magic, to make it wonderful? That's a great start. And whatever you have in terms of materials, as Chris said before, you, you won't have course books. You wouldn't be able to possibly start with a course book because you wouldn't know what the background of the kids were. But you go in there and create, use the, the learner as resource. So we're going to talk about the magic spaces, curating materials for that space, often with very, very little or no resource. And uh, in part two, we're going to go more into the actual activities and range in how we can make materials for our activities and use things like doodles, drawings, word clouds. And finally, we'll be talking about games, but again, using the learner's resource, games that kids can create and play balls that you can get the kids to come up with. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to the magic question. Okay. So, first. Okay, so um, before we start with that, so we talked about expectations, and of course we also have to think about what Julie just said, the external factors. So um, what we've got in the magic classroom is actually, oops, so it's thinking about how we set up the magic space, so how we actually create the classroom. So what you see here, for example, is of course a tent school. So a tent means that you don't really have big spots to which you can put things. So it's not like nice and easy that you can put up all the stuff you have. A tent school also possibly means you may not have chairs or something like this, so you may have to create seating activities or seating opportunities and spaces for the kids to move around. The key thing, however, from the very start is that you need to understand there isn't a no-resource classroom. There are two resources already available. One is you, and one is your students. And you need to really get engaged with your students from the very beginning, because they need a positive atmosphere, especially when you think about disruptive classrooms. The positive atmosphere really supports the learning, as it does in every classroom. And to do that from the very beginning, you need to get the kids to create their own classroom. So can you give me some ideas, maybe, what you could do in a tent school to, to get the kids, help you create a classroom? What would be important? What would you motivate them to do? Use the chat room for this. I hope the, the question came across clearly this time. So the picture you see here is, of course, getting pictures. Why are pictures important? Pictures of flowers or something? Because they bring in color and they create, again, the positive atmosphere. The students come in and very often they want to break from the old routine because there isn't really much for them to do. So they're very eager to spend time in the classroom. And of course, by creating the pictures with the kids together, you already set out on a very easy and simple activity with the kids because they start painting, you teach them maybe the colors, you teach them the name, like what is a flower, what is a tree, or something like this. As a question here, Julie, are the pictures painted by, is that painted by the students, is it painted by you? So I actually painted that. Uh, uh, Julie painted um, that, so sorry. We are going to try and set up a tent school and get kids to paint yeah. it. So this picture in particular was painted by Julie, but if you watch the hard ELT video that we might show you in the break, you see that the kids are also painting things. 
So, and of course, when you have a pen school, you need to find roughs or something like this to put up the pictures. So, um, we mentioned already textbooks, and of course, I actually think textbooks are not that much use. Because um, very often you can only have one textbook, and the kids might not be familiar with the kind of classical Western European textbooks learning or standard class textbook learning in the first place. So what you need to do is, of course, you need to get the whiteboards. There's no whiteboards, and they're very like simple whiteboards that you can use. The only thing is, you need to make pictures of the whiteboard. So, um, so Julie got one, which I just put to the camera, which is really like that small and very lightweight and just goes basically into every suitcase. Just remember that you have to take pictures of whatever you put on the whiteboard to recycle that for your own class. So, the magic space, however, that doesn't sound very magic, but it's very important to engage the kids from the beginning so that they create like their own home environment to which they love to come. Because this kind of looking forward to this positive idea of English lessons or any kind of lessons is really important because it helps them also to, to struggle or to actually to survive certain kind of difficult situations that they are in. So, okay, we go on to the materials. Okay, so um, we're going to move on to actually outsourcing materials and with kids it's very easy to give them a piece of cardboard, to give them an old box, to give them some old cups or yogurt pots and get them to create using those items. They don't have any hang-ups about, oh, that's just an old box. So it's a, you know very easy to start off creating. You just like not the most point instead of the left. Okay, so as I've already said before briefly, the kids are working together with the teacher to create those materials. So your maker space is really a combination of the teacher and and the kids. And maybe the teacher could start off giving the kids an idea what we could do with a cardboard box, what we could do with some paper cups, what we could do with old newspapers and just lead them into you know, a starting point and then the kids I'm sure will run with that. So okay. I'm doing yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're gonna talk more about the actual um upsource materials later on in the session. But first of all Kirsten's going to tell you about her mini toolkit which is an amazing resource and very small, very easy to put into your suitcase. So, um, I think we're talking about two sets of materials. So, upsourced materials is what you will create together with the kids from what's in the surroundings. So, we're going to talk about this also when we talk about activities. But of course, you will, when you go to an environment where you work with a no or low resource classroom, you will need to prepare yourself at home. And as mentioned before, you cannot pack stacks of books. You could try, but it's really going to work. You cannot pack 25,000 CDs or something like this. You will have to face the thing that like power isn't a reliable resource. Now, so because electricity might not be available. So if you have all these high power eating um, devices or something like this, it's not going to work. And of course, um, basically, you can't really pack a lot of stuff. So what we have here in the picture, um, I would need to include the whiteboard in this, is something like maybe half a kilogram, one kilogram of materials. And most of this goes into this tiny little box. As you can see, this was once upon a Christmas gift box. So, the first thing is, you do need something like a tablet or a phone. Of course, you can also use a tablet for something like power, uh, no, PowerPoint, but as a kind of whiteboard as well, but that's quite expensive. Um, if you use your phone, um, the good thing is, as soon as it's offline, it doesn't eat that much power as well. So, upload sound files onto your phone and invest some money. A bit of money, how much does that cost, Julie? A bit of money into the whiteboard, maybe a couple of pounds for this. This here is a bit more expensive, but it's really worth it. This is a USB speaker which once you charge it, lasts about 20 hours. We tried this on holiday, we played 20 hours of music and it didn't break down. 
So this is by a maker called U.E. Rowell. But um, the point is, of course, that um, once you connect this to your phone, you really have sounds that works for the whole classroom. Now, so the speakers on your phone are very, very quiet. And with this, you can really fill a classroom that's made for like 50 people. I tried that out. So it costs some money, but it's definitely worth the investment. So what you also need is colored paper, which sounds very simple, but you know, you get these kind of card, card boxes with, I think it's like 10 different colors. You get 20 sheets each or something. So it's also some investment you should make because you can use it for a number of things. For example, you can use it for verbs. So here I created verb cards, and we come back to them, and you can put the verb on this, and then you flip this, use it as a flip card, and you put the past simple form on the back or something like this. I would also suggest that you really use different colors for different types of words. So when you start making sentences with the kids, they can actually put the things in the right order and they learn that like what articles are like, what nouns and what subjects are like, uh, or sorry, and adjectives are like, and so on. And color paper is also very good because you can draw pictures. So we come back to that later. Down in the box are kind of matching pair cards and mini flashcards. And if you're not a great artist, like me, I can't draw particularly well. You'll see that later. It's a good idea to write to publishers like North Star, Telc, Oxford, or whatever, because they get these samples away for free. So you actually get a good kind of easy resources for adjectives or whatever without or help situations without painting or drawing all of this yourself. The same goes for like little grammar books or whatever. So um, same goes for speaking activity cards. Another example from Talc. But if you haven't got access to this, then I show you what I did. And I hope you remember you recognize this. So just try to hold this up into the camera. This is of course a picture from the IKEA catalogue. And I use this because it shows here kids. It shows kids and toys. And if you, for example, deal with words for furniture, rooms of the house, or whatever, something like this, which you can just fold up, and they have t tons of objects on one page, are also very good. So I use that with A1, A2 level students, and I get a picture of like every room with some activities. And of course, you can use that in a number of ways, so we come back to that later with the activities. And lastly, in our toolkit, there are these Oh, no, no problem. There are these uh, post-it notes. This is an idea I got from my husband. So, because the post-it notes are big enough to write on, and um, you can just label them on large scale pictures, on the floor, or whatever. You can even write the name of the object in the classroom on the post-it note and just stick it to the object. So this way, you get a very easy resource to help people, to help the students remember vocabulary. Um, again, something that isn't that cheap because you need to go for the original one, but you get them in different colors. So like the colored cards, you can use this for different kinds of objects or words or whatever. And they're also like a great investment and they're very, very easy to carry. So and for what I've shown you, I would say you have something like two weeks teaching material for all kinds of situations. And we come back to that when we talk about the activities. So that's basically what you can prepare in terms of very low resources, just traveling lightweight and having already some stuff available before you get into the classroom and see what's available for what we call upsourced materials. And of course, Julie is going to talk a bit more about that. Okay. Okay, the next, we're going to talk about upsource materials, but first of all I want to talk about the dream space. Um, I created a dream space with a box, a simple box, which I call the theatre of dreams. And this simple piece of material can be used for so many different things. Um, you, well, I've got a picture of there, but we've actually, we've actually got the box. 
We've got the box here, so we'll show you the box. Okay, so it's a simple box, and when you open it up, it says Theatre of Dreams, and enter here. Yes. And as you can see, um, again, this box, you just put all your materials inside it when you're not using it, and you've got a nice compact classroom to carry around. So the idea of a box as a piece of material that can be used again and again. Um, I know people who have tried this dream space and they've used, particularly in a lot of different scenarios with refugee kids, the word dream has been used in, you know, in a lot of um, different ways um, to create, just, you know, get kids to talk about normal stuff, kids that have been traumatized because they've had a difficult time, they still have a lot of dreams. So, with the dream space, initially, you just need to say to the kids, what, what is the dream space? What can you do in the dream space? What do you think a dream space is? So, you know, this one was called Theatre of Dreams, but your kids may give it a different name. It might be a dream cloud. It might be a dream forest. So, one simple idea, one simple box, but a lot of different activities can be done with that and it can be carried on because the, part of the lesson every day could be okay let's go into the dream space now let's go to the theatre of dreams so in this particular theatre we've got some yogurt men little yogurt pot men and uh, the kids again create these um, the idea can come from the kids because you give them a box of these old yogurt pots and say, right, what can we have when we make the people who could be in the theatre? And perhaps they create themselves. They might put their names on them. There might be animals. There might be people. So, again, the materials and the idea might come from the teacher initially, but moving on, the kids take it forward and it can be carried on for a long time. So um, we're going to, in part two, talk a lot more about making various materials, but here is a list of obviously the makerspace material that you may have on hand and some ideas what you could do. So cardboard boxes, in my opinion, have a lot of uses. They're very versatile. You can, we talked about the whiteboards, you can make whiteboards from them. You can make story cards, you can make jigsaw cards, and these can be kept again in your boxes. So if you have a couple of cardboard boxes, I know from people working in refugee camps that boxes are the thing they have, you know, a, a big supply of those. There's constantly supplies, medical supplies, food supplies. So boxes are the main resource really to use for upsourcing. Um, newspapers are often packing materials in with medical supplies and sometimes you get those polystyrene shapes, um, bottles, cans, a lot of this stuff is freely available in a camp, freely available in a different scenario, even if you're teaching in Africa or in a remote place, there's always food stuff coming in and some of it's in boxes. So, as I said, we're going to move on into session two about actually making materials and uh, give you a couple of ideas how we can start the kids off with an idea and then again, they take it forward. But now, uh, Kirsten's going to talk about, and um, continuing the subject, that learners actually lead the way. The, the kids give them a, a little idea, you plant a seed and they take it forward. Um, so, Kirsten's now going to move on with um, her to talk about learners leading the way. So, um, for those of you who maybe did not join in in the beginning, so we said that with learners leading the way, there's a lot of shift in teaching anyway. So, maybe I should move that, yeah. So, there's a lot of shift in teaching anyway towards a more learner-centered classroom, but if you are in something like a refugee camp, you have no choice. So, because, uh, as we said, all these kind of standard materials aren't available. And I know a lot of teachers are scared by this because they say, well, what will I work with? And I say, actually, don't be scared. This is a great opportunity because it's actually changing the way you teach, but it's also more appropriate to the way people learn. And people actually learn together by copying things, writing down things, explaining and doing activities together. They actually also build more social skills 
Now, so which is very important, so you get a better kind of community sense into the classroom, and you will actually see that moving away from this kind of textbook and photocopy mania that seems to be the rule in some of the schools, and I know that from my niece and nephew who are at school and learn English that way, it might actually be a great idea. So what we have is, of course, the problem, in inverted commas, of not having textbooks or enough textbooks. So what, what do you do if you say you take a couple of books but you have only one copy and you cannot make photocopies? So what will you do? Some ideas, please, before we move into our, our demonstration here. You have only one book like this and you have like 20 people. So what are you going to do with this? Oh, yeah. Mime story, very good, Jen. Yes, exactly. So it can get people to mime things, and the others have to guess what they're stolen and what they're talking about. So that is certainly a very important element. Okay. So you can see Cheryl's typing something, but I can't see that yet in the chat. Okay. Draw pics. Oh. So you see, we're very good at making that very fast. Draw pics. So here we go. Where did we end up? Yeah, that next That's one. Draw pics, exactly. So, and I can't see all of the chat here, but I try. So, oh. sing. Yes. Okay. So you can sing, of course. Good. You're going to have fun in the second part of the session. So, um, what we suggested is, for example, the book that we have here. Where's my spider? Oh, spider's gone. Oh, my God. The book that we have here is very basic rhymes for children. And I'm sure that you know a lot of that. And um, yeah, so you see the picture. Uh, what we are looking at is the Incy Wincy spider story. Do you all know the story? <laughs> I think it's Helen's favourite story. <laughs> so Julie just says it's Helen's favourite story. So maybe some people are afraid of spiders. So what you do is, of course, you create a group activity. So maybe you manage at home to, to have one photocopy of different stories. So And the idea is basically you get one of the more fluent students to read the story to the others. Then you get one or two students to act this out. And you get a third or fourth student to copy some of the words that they have to learn, for example, some nouns, um, to the whiteboard or a piece of paper. This is what it looks like in real life. So this is video one. Oh, no, sorry, that's the other one. Oh, no, I, I know what I'm doing wrong. So I have to click play here. So. So, I think we'll play that again because you missed a bit. So, this is just me doing my miming, basically. And then we would connect this with the writing. So, somebody, like one of the kids, would copy the key nouns from this activity. Spider, water, rain, and sun. And even though you're not a great artist, you're just like mediocre like me, you can just use some pictures to visualize. Yeah, I think this is possibly the worst drawn spider you've seen in your entire life. It looks more like a tick, actually, than a spider. And that is basically something that gives you the idea of what you can do with it. And, of course, you can also follow up. So you can go and create a song out of this. I'm sorry, for some reason, the picture is not very big. Um, yeah, but um, I didn't do anything, so I think 
that's what I thought. So, um, and that's something, for example, where you can just like integrate groups and they do different parts of the activity. So if their vocabulary isn't that great, they can do the mining. If they can write, they can do the writing. If they're able to read English, they can do the narrating. So just have to see how I can actually um, get this smaller. Where? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to two minutes. Oh, okay. So we just... Ah! Ah! So don't do anything I wouldn't do here. We had enough technical problems today. Okay. Okay, I think that's... Okay, that's... That will, that, that will do. Good. So that's basically... Learners lead the way. So as soon as you engage them into this kind of activities and create things for them together, their learning behavior, of course, changes, especially when you're expecting the spider walk is littered at the beginning. Yeah, I, I hope that became clear that I was trying to do the spider here with my hand, but I'm sure you're better actors than I am. So um, so this is where I think, actually, you shouldn't be too worried if you, don't can, if you cannot take tons of textbooks. So... Working with books only works if you have achieved a certain level of literacy with the students. Um, so you can use it as a resource, but you will have different age groups, different skill groups in your classroom. So, and therefore, you need to find an, uh, find other activities to work with them. And of course, in cre creating sounds and songs for them, it's a much better idea of um, getting them to work as a group. So if you can't photocopy worksheets, you actually use the yellow um, whiteboard or yellow board, we should possibly say. I don't really think that if you have a tent, a chalkboard is available, even though I love chalkboards, but um, I think that would be very difficult. So the small, easy whiteboards will actually be quite good. So you can also think about other ways of breaking down lessons. So like thinking about vocabulary, reading comprehension or whatever, and just make sure that you assign tasks to the students they can manage and that you uh, assign tasks that are actually quite good to do. So I hand over for another activity to um, Julie. Okay, I noticed that the time has been set up so that we stop it through for a break. So, uh, but we're nearly done anyway. Yeah, so, so we'll, we'll probably do that. So I just think I've just got about like five minutes. Um, yeah, you can do that. Just go back and do the Chinese spring thing. Okay. Well, I just want to end this session uh, by talking about something we're going to go into more in the second session. And that's obviously the maker space. And what we're going to do at the end is give you a task. You can actually earn your own maker space badge. So we'll be asking you to create two activities based on what you've seen today or based on some of the materials that we're showing some of the um, uh, boxes and upsource um, trash that you can use. And we'd like you to share those ideas on the HeartELT Facebook page and or you can send them to heartelt.org to the website. And so, you know, this will also create a resource bank for other teachers so people can go in and have a look at those activities. And we're going to be doing a series of these uh, workshops so it will, you know, continue and we'll have quite a nice resource bank in, in the future. So we're going to take a bit of a break now and we're going Finish to off with the video. We're going to show you a video um, and it will give you a little bit of background about the Heart ELT project if you're not familiar with that. And we're going to go and have some injections of coffee now. And just hope that the settings are going to stay in place and we're going to have sound and camera and everything. We won't session. touch anything. We're not going to touch anything. We'll see you in a moment. Thanks a lot. Have hope. I have hope. Have faith. I have faith. Have courage. I have courage. Have soul. Have it in you. I have it in me. You can do it. I can do it. You've got what it takes. I got what it takes. Keep going. I keep going. Don't give up. I won't give up. Stay focused. I'll stay focused. Do 
your best. I'll do my best. You've got talent. I've got talent. You've got skills. I've got skills. You're smart. I am smart. You're strong. I am strong. Give it your all. I'll give it my all. Give it your all. I'll give it my all. That. <laughs> so, okay, so that was the beginning. Good. And then we have the second one. So, half past two, isn't it? And that was because I was not uh, really working with the headset that well. So, um, um, we tried actively participate and get into doing rather than just listening and taking notes. Exactly. Good idea for. It's actually off now.